today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom, and this is our 96th show. We'd like to thank our episode sponsor, Takeda Oncology, and we're very grateful for their support of the Myeloma Crowd Radio program. Before we get started, I'd like to invite you to participate in this year's Muscles for Myeloma program. Now, as you know, March is Myeloma Awareness Month, and in honor of that program, uh, we are running something that can help you to get fit. Uh, We'll run this from March until the end of April, and we're doing it because fitness matters for everyone, but it's especially important for myeloma patients who are being segmented into fit, unfit, and frail categories. There are some treatments, like stem cell transplant that we'll talk about today, that they cannot receive if they're not fit. So this year, we're inviting patients from across the nation to join us in support of their local myeloma academic center. We have over 20 teams in place where myeloma specialists reside, like Duke, MD Anderson, Mayo Clinic, and Dana-Farber, to just name a few. All the proceeds raised by each team are, will be donated to that center's myeloma research and not the myeloma crowd. This is a way we want to support a national effort for both myeloma awareness and myeloma research during Myeloma Awareness Month. So you can register online at give.crowdcare.org and then forward slash muscles2017. You can set your own fitness goal, so it doesn't matter what level of fitness you're at today. You can be right out of transplant or be in an extended remission and being feeling good. It just doesn't matter. Just set a stretch goal that's right for you for that 60 days. You can update your page with a photo, your goal, and even your photos. Then share your page for Myeloma Awareness Month and invite your friends and family to support you in getting fit. We even have a really cool Muscles for Myeloma phone app that will allow you to track your daily exercise, your weight, steps taken, and other kinds of metrics like that. Each team for Muscles for Myeloma also has 10 local challenges. So if you complete those team challenges and mark them off in the app, you can be entered into raffle a raffle for prizes like Fitbits and fitness gift cards. So you can join today so you're ready to go on March 1st as we get fit together and help accelerate a cure. Now, I know a lot of times stem cell transplant is just not an easy process. Uh, we'll be talking about stem cell transplant today and specifically allogeneic or donor transplant which is not used very frequently in myeloma therapy, but it could be a very effective strategy for patients to consider, especially if they're young, high-risk patients. So with us today is Dr. Christina Gasparetto of the Duke University Medical Center to tell us more. Welcome, Dr. Gasparetto. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Well, you get extra bonus points today because I know you're recovering (laughs) from an an illness. So thank you so much for joining us, even though, um, you know, you you probably wish uh, you're feeling totally up to speed. Well, let me give an introduction for you before we get started. Um, Dr. Gasparetto is Associate Professor of Medicine at the Duke University Medical Center. She is on a variety of committees, including the NCCN Guideline Multiple Myeloma Panel. She is co-founder of the Duke UNC Wake North Carolina Multiple Myeloma Study Group. She is a core member of the International Myeloma Working Group, a core member of the Aptum Myeloma Consortium, and a member of the Connect Multiple Myeloma Registry and the Alliance CALGB, which is a clinical trial uh, group. She has received the Cancer Treatment Research Foundation Award for Myeloma, the Lisa Stafford Award Multiple Myeloma Research Award, and the AMYC Award. Dr. Gasparetto's primary interests are in developing immunotherapy approaches in conjunction with stem cell transplant. So these approaches include vaccines and antibody therapy. She's pursuing clinical trials that include dendritic cell vaccines, antibody therapies, different types of allotransplants, peripheral blood stem cell transplants, and partial HLA matching transplants using cord blood. So in doing my homework uh, for this show, she had such extensive expertise in transplant. I'm just really thrilled to have you on the show. Thank you. Well, why don't we start in with um, just a broad overview of allotransplant in the myeloma setting? Well, you know... This is a very difficult uh, topic because uh, allogeneic transplant, uh, um, it's a a difficult, it's a difficult transplant. We we generally 
um, use uh, donor cells to establish uh, an immunosystem in the, the recipient, the patient. And, and uh, in this uh, allogeneic transplant from myeloma was introduced many, many years ago, but unfortunately, um, the mortality associated with this approach back, I'm talking back in the 80s, in the 90s, was very high, uh, 40, 50 percent. So it was a very difficult uh, uh, decision to recommend an allogeneic transplant to a patient with myeloma because uh, uh, there was 50-50 chance of uh, uh, no uh, be able to uh, uh, successfully complete the procedure. I'm talking about a 50% chance of that. So the allogeneic transplant was uh, abandoned in the 90s for this reason, because the mortality was too high. When uh, mm -hmm. we went back and uh, looked at the data, um, we were all uh, surprised to see that actually patients who were able to survive and did well after allogeneic transplant, maybe were cured. Uh, you know, there were mm -hmm. some patients, there are patients uh, alive and well many, many years after allogeneic transplant. And so uh, we decided to bring it back in different ways, in different forms, uh, um, improving, uh, you know, uh, the transplant. So the mortality rate is now down to 10, 15 percent. Um, we have different types of uh, transplant, but, uh, you know, for uh, many years and we, we know even now that it's very difficult to tell a patient that we can cure uh, myeloma, but maybe with allogeneic transplant, we have done that. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want to describe uh, the different types of allogeneic transplants? Because there I know there are some that are uh, like myoblative and non, yeah. and some yeah. minis or haplos, and sometimes it's yeah. a little bit confusing to understand all the different it's kinds of allotransplants. It's very confusing. It's very confusing. So uh, the old fashion, the old way was to do a myeloblative allogeneic transplant, where we, uh, that means myeloblative, we are using a very high dose chemotherapy, so we can ablate control, you know, kill all the myeloma and at the same time uh, suppress the immune system of the recipient. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the big transplant. Patients have to remain in the hospital for about a month uh, until, ta until they have uh, recovered and then they have to stay uh, the center of the transplant for an additional couple of months. And that transplant is uh, difficult uh, with a lot of complications. The mortality, as I say, in the 80s and the 90s was up to 90 percent, uh, I'm sorry, 50 percent. But we are getting better with that too. And, uh, and, um, and that is a possibility, an option for some patient where definitely uh, can do that, particularly in patients where the myeloma is not well controlled. So we are using the high dose chemotherapy not only to suppress their immunosystem, but also to kill all the residual myeloma. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, because the mortality associated with this approach was too high, in the 90s, late 90s, the, the normal ablative or the mini transplant uh, was developed, not only for myeloma, but for other diseases, of course, for other metallurgic diseases. And the idea behind was, you know, uh, in order to do a myeloablative transplant, you have to have a young patient, fit, good performance status with a good donor, and, and that was not the case for a lot of patients. So why we don't do this mini transplant in the outpatient setting where we use chemotherapy to um, suppress, to immunosuppress them so they can receive the immunosystem of the donor, because the bottom line is the allogeneic, the approach of the allogeneic transplant is to replace the immune system of the patient. Uh, so uh, the immune system of the patient clearly is not working, and so we're giving the patient a new immune system to control the myeloma from coming back. So with a normal ablative, the idea was like, let's just suppress the immune system 
and then uh, um, use uh, the donor cells to repopulate the immune system. And while the approach is safer, uh, the risk of dying on the approach is much lower and is an outpatient procedure. When we analyzed the data, that we, we saw there was no enough to control the myeloma for a long period of time. In fact, patients continue to relapse over time because um, unfortunately the myeloma was still there and it was not enough, was not powerful enough. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and so there are different, a lot of strategies that are under development to improve both of these approaches. And then, uh, uh, you know, we generally, uh, the ideal scenario is when we have a donor, a sibling, a match related mm-hmm. donor, but that is also very difficult, right? You need to have sibling. Uh, you need to have uh, one that completely match. Um, and so we also do uh, match unrelated. So we go to the donor search looking for uh, a, um, a donor, a match unrelated donor. Um, we also do uh, upload transplant where we use uh, relative, uh, it could be a father, mother, it can be a, ch- a child or a sibling that is only half matching. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. But the upload, you know, you kind of embark uh, in a lot of other issues, and I actually don't necessarily uh, use the upload approach for myeloma yet because uh, uh, the risk of having uh, um, gaster sosos disease is high, which is the, the, um, uh, the immunosystem of the donor attacking the immunosystem of the recipient. So uh, you really need to uh, suppress this patient for a long period of time, and I'm very concerned with the myeloma because during that period of time, the myeloma can, in fact, flare up and cause trouble because the key is to have a myeloma well controlled until the new graft, the new immune system, is able to repopulate and control the disease from coming back. Mm, interesting. So it course, might give it too big of a window. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to have a window. Exactly. I always try to explain uh, to my patients with uh, the normal ablative, I need to uh, bring patients with a phenomenal response. So I have. Uh, few months to work until the new graft, the new immune system established. With the myeloblative, I also control the myeloma with the high-dose chemotherapy. Mm. Okay. And the, when the siblings are complete match like a twin, what is that uh, called? It's in Janae. Is that a- and it's actually, so there was an old study that was published comparing the autologous when, when it's, you use your own stem cells, allogeneic from a donor, and then syngeneic if you have an identical twin. And believe it or not, the syngeneic results were pretty, pretty remarkable, but unfortunately, um, you know, it's very difficult it doesn't have to very have often. an identical <laughs> twin. Yeah, I have done right. three at Duke and uh, very successful. And um, particularly, I have one that, my God, is many, many years after. Uh, so, you know, it's, it would be great, but it doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. On the same time, sometimes we don't want um, so much you know, we don't want the same type of immunosystem. We want a little bit of disparity because we want to be able to suppress the myeloma with the immunosystem. It's immunotherapy. And so to have uh, the same type of immunosystem might not work. But, the, you know, the data with the Syngenic were very interesting. And um, like you just mentioned, I've had other doctors say this too, that, that the allotransplant is really the first quote, immunotherapy that has been used in yeah. myeloma. Yeah, yeah, yes. Because yes. you're basically yeah, because replacing the immune system? Okay. You're replacing the immune system. And that is the concept. that You are giving a patient a new immune system. Um, and, and, you know, we have data showing that, even old data showing that um, 
even after allogeneic transplant, using boost of lymphocytes donor was helping uh, to recontrol the disease. So, and we have a lot of data showing that the immune system plays an important role in myeloma and all the different type of immunotherapy, of course, uh, that is growing tremendously. But allogeneic transplant is a form of immunotherapy. We're giving a patient a new immunosystem. We replace the immunosystem. We transplant the mm-hmm. immunosystem. And that's the reason why it's so risky, it's so tough. And, uh, but over the last 20 years, we've improved tremendously. We have data showing that the mortality, the chance of dying during the procedure went all the way down. We have a phenomenal team with great supportive care. So we're carried through this transplant. Uh, we have, you know, new drugs that we didn't have available, antifungal, because during uh, the period of time when the patient is immunosuppressed because he has to mm-hmm. accept a new immunosystem, there is a higher risk of uh, infections. So now we have right. phenomenal drugs. We, we check viruses every week. Uh, we have antifungal. We are very proactive. While in the past, we didn't know. We didn't know what was going on. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't available yet. Well, let me ask no. you about matching yeah. before we kind of talk about um, the what I really want to get into. But how closely do you – you said you may not want an exact match for the immune system. So how closely do you want to match? I know sometimes there's a score, right, like a 10 out of right. 10, and you would think that's a great score. And then I hear some doctors say, well, maybe we can do an 8 or 9 out of 10, and that might be even better. How do yeah. you – you know, yeah. maybe you want to just talk about that HLA matching process. So uh, the, the humo, uh, human uh, leukocyte antigen are pretty much a code of our immune system, uh, and uh, they help our immune system to make sure that, you know, it's us, uh, and, and they reject everything that is foreign. So uh, uh, we try to match it, but, for example, if you have uh, the best, you know, match will be a 12 out of 12. And, uh, oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, but, but, you know, we know that there are uh, something that we are not checking. So we know that if we have a donor from the donor registry, even if it's 12 out of 12, it's not an identical twin. So there is, you know, there is going to be some uh, uh, disparities there. So, and, uh, and then when you start, you know, when you have uh, a mismatch of one, like a, um, it, it's, it's very difficult to explain because, <laughs> because mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it means you, you can do a 9 out of 10 and still have a very uh, successful, but depend where the mismatch is. So we go through, you know, all this testing. We test the sibling, we compare it, we do additional testing, and the, the donor uh, registering, we do the same. It's all computerized where... Um, they give us an idea of many potential donors a patient could have, and then we go more in depth to find out mm-hmm. if uh, um, if the coding you know uh, can match so it 's very difficult to explain so when uh, um, so uh, you know ideally. Uh, well, it will yeah, be it's a process. It's well, not as well. <laughs> it's a process. Uh-huh. Uh, in Aplo, is generally so you 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 eradicate half um, of the code from your mom and half of your uh, your dad. So um, if you have siblings, so they have twenty five percent chance of being the same as you. Uh, so in an Aplo situations, we use a sibling that may have only half of the coding that you have. Mhm. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, I know in doing some research just on what to talk about today, you had such extensive experience with transplant in general and outcomes. Um, maybe you want to give us just a kind of an overarching view of what you've learned in general. For example, you did work on auto transplant and outcomes for older versus younger patients. And then you did post-transplant outcomes in high-risk versus not high-risk patients. So what have you learned in looking at the transplant setting and why are you considering the allotransplant as a potential great strategy? So, you know, I always 
I am not pro chemotherapy. I wish we could come out of the chemotherapy. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, from all the data that we have and also from my experience, uh, um, high dose chemotherapy uh, given, you know, at once uh, to kill all the residual myeloma remains a very important part of the treatment for patients with myeloma. And the, the autologous transplant it should not even be called a transplant. We collect the stem cells of the patient to rescue them after uh, the high dose chemotherapy. But, we, you know, we have data for new studies in, uh, in the era of all these new agents still showing the superiority of transplant because at the bottom line, we are able to achieve a deeper response with the high dose chemotherapy. And, uh, and so the strategy works. Um, you know, and then uh, we use the maintenance uh, to um, improve the durability of response. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, it, it works for the majority of patients, but you still have a, a population of patients that the transplant is not as durable. And, you know, you have some patients mm-hmm. progressing within a year. And so that is, you know, a very uh, difficult situation because the moment that the patient progresses after transplant, you know that you are dealing with a very aggressive myeloma. And uh, yes, we do have a lot of new drugs, but it's the nature of the myeloma will eventually become resistant uh, to all these uh, drugs. And that's the reason why we decided, you know, because we know, we know that patients relapsing very early after autologous transplant, um, we decided to, to uh, explore the possibility of introducing allogeneic transplant for these patients. So um, transplant is safe. I'm trying to answer your question uh, for patients mm-hmm. in good performance status, older patients, we have data retrospective data um, showing uh, that if a patient is older than 70 but in good performance status, the transplant is safe and effective. The outcome is very similar to the younger patient. So transplant should be at least offered to consider it to all patients with myeloma. Uh, but it's not, unfortunately, it's not the answer for all patients with myeloma, and that's the reason why we need to think about, you know, some other strategies, uh, in addition to, to the allogeneic transplant, not all patients will be eligible for allogeneic transplant. Uh, we're also modified in the induction therapy, the maintenance. Uh, we definitely need to develop uh, these signature trials where patients are treated in a different way based on their genetics. But allogeneic, allogeneic transplant could be an option for patients with very high-risk myeloma up front or uh, we are progressing very rapidly after autologous transplant because we know that we are dealing with a very difficult myeloma, and I think we need to take the risks of the allo and uh, try to, uh, you know, overcome and uh, maybe cure some of these patients. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when my doctor first, when I was first diagnosed, one of the ideas yeah. was that when you're first coming into it as a newly diagnosed patient, well, you haven't had all the, you know, cumulative effects uh, for a long-term treatment. And his opinion was, you know, you get the first opportunity of treatment is probably your best shot at cure. So let's hit it as hard as possible to to say, could we achieve a cure at the beginning? Um, and is that possible? Yeah, is that some of the rationale behind the younger patients? Well, it's becoming a new concept on the myeloma community. I remember when we, I started to treat patients with myeloma, uh, if a patient was unable to achieve a complete response, uh, uh, just a very good partial response, you know, a more than 90% reduction of the markers of the protein, we were okay with that. Uh, now we are aiming to achieve a deeper response. We think, and we have data showing that if you achieve uh, a, a deeper response, that will translate uh, in a, a longer durability. And so the idea is maybe we need to be, because you're right, so I think you need to play all your cards up front because the first 
response the first time they achieve a complete remission, that complete remission will last the longest. Is the longest because when a myeloma comes back, uh, yeah, we might be able to achieve a complete remission again, or maybe not. And then, and, but what will become the durability is going to become shorter and shorter, and that's, that's what we know. So we have to bet all the money up front, and that's the reason why we are developing trial where we're trying to uh, achieve uh, uh, a stringent complete remission very quickly with the combination of therapy, then the eye-dose therapy, then the maintenance, uh, with the idea maybe if we bring patients to a very deep response, so we're going to be able to cure some patients. On the same time, <laughs> it's very complicated mm-hmm. because there are some patients uh, who are evolving from an, an, uh, smoldering from an MGAS and that they're there for many years before they transform to a myeloma, that when you treat them, they go back to their MGAS state so they don't need to achieve a complete remission because they're going to go there and they'll be, be okay, but we are unable to identify these patients yet. So one of the... Uh, crusade now uh, in the myeloma community is trying to achieve, you know, minimal residual disease, the best response, particularly younger patients with high-risk disease, so we can keep the myeloma in remission the longest, uh, and that is mm-hmm. pretty much what's going on. Maybe you'll treat some patients a little bit earlier so we can cure some patients. Mm-hmm. And then how are you defining high-risk patients? Who would you consider to be high-risk when you're thinking about these younger high-risk patients? So uh, we we based uh, uh, our determination on the cytogenetics. And so, you know, we know, for instance, uh, that um, deletion 17 of chromosome 17 is uh, a poor pronostic factor. And then there are uh, mm-hmm. some translocation on chromosome 14, like uh, the 414 translocation, the 1416. We also have uh, amplification or loss of chromosome 1. Um, and so if you want to just generalize um, I will divide the patients in two groups. So hypo, meaning lacking, lossing of chromosomes is bad. Gaining chromosomes, so if you have a patient gaining, you know, different chromosomes is better. So uh, these two groups. And then, um, and then uh, generally, you know, these are the cytogenetics. And it's not written in stone, it's evolving um, uh, this is changing a little bit uh, even on the cytogenetic, and it's very important to uh, have cytogenetic done on the uh, isolated myeloma cells. But also uh, how we determine if a patient has high risk is how long the patient is able to remain in remission the first time. So if a patient remains in remission more than 18 months, we think he is a more treatable myeloma, but if a patient progresses, relapses within 18 months from initiation of therapy, then uh, uh, we consider those patients having a more high-risk disease, and then we become, you know, more aggressive. So the durability mm-hmm. and it might not, the first yeah. response, yeah. So that's just a, how you respond to treatment, not necessarily what your yeah. genetic features are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can have a good genetic and then have the transplant and progressing three months later, you definitely have to attack, you have to treat the patient as a high risk. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's it's about looking at both of those and being aware of that. Yeah. I think um, it's really important for patients to understand what kind of myeloma they have. And yeah. uh, for those who are listening, if you have not had some of these um, cytogenetics or gene expression profiling tests done, Ask your doctor about it because if you have active disease, they can be found. Now, if you've been on treatment, right, it's, and you're in a remission-type status, they're not going to show up because you don't have any of these cells. It's really key for patients to oh, it, it, be able to have these tests. Because, absolutely, I agree with you, Jenny, because it also guides us, uh, guide me, uh, you know, how deep I want to go after transplant. Do I have to, you know, be a little bit more aggressive to achieve the deeper response? So it's very important, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And when you think about, so let's talk about high-risk um, 
uh, younger patients with allotransplant. How do you approach that, and what do you typically do up front and then during and then after as an approach for the, these patients? So, um, you know, because, they are, as I mentioned, the allogeneic transplant is, is such a difficult uh, um, procedure, a difficult uh, um, treatment to offer to a patient. I think uh, I always recommend uh, to consider uh, treatment as part of a clinical trial. And we actually do have uh, a, a national uh, clinical trial going on for this subset of patients um, where patients with high risk disease based on cytogenetic or gene expression profiling, like you mentioned, at time of diagnosis, or patients who uh, uh, receive their induction therapy and their transplant and then they rapidly progressed, they have uh, a clinical trial um, of an allogeneic clinical trial available, and this is going on nationally. Um, and uh, and is it actually is a normal ablative transplant because uh, uh, we were concerned about the high risk mortality. And to improve the normal ablative transplant, we incorporate a maintenance after allogeneic transplant. But, you know, maintenance is so important after autologous transplant, so we are exploring maintenance after allogeneic transplant. Okay, and you said it was non-myoblative or, or it's myoblative? It's non-myoblative. It's reduced intensity. So reduced intensity. Uh, the okay. chemo, yes, yes. It's no, you know, there is chemotherapy, but it's not like, you know, it's an outpatient procedure uh, and the patients need to go to this approach, you know, with a very well-controlled myeloma. And then uh, we have a maintenance uh, incorporated after the transplant. Okay, and as I read about that trial, it looks like you're using exazomib to yeah. do your maintenance yes. on that trial. So yes. do you want to explain what that is for those who don't know what that is? Well, the idea is, um, you know, we want to use a, a drug um, that can control the myeloma from coming back, but also potentially, you know, can help with uh, uh, graft versus off disease. What's the graft versus off disease? is one of the possible complications of allogeneic transplant where a patient, um, the new immunosystem is going to attack the patient and that they, uh, and can be deadly, a deadly compl- complications uh, can manifest uh, with the skin, uh, GI, liver issue, and, um, and can be uh, really devastating and uh, and so the graft versus disease we're all concerned about because how we, we treated the graft versus disease, we treat the, the graft versus disease with immunosuppressants. And so that means that the patient is receiving more drug to, immuno, to immunosuppress uh, the immunosystem, and that defeats the purpose of our transplant because we want the patient to develop a new immunosystem. So the exosomy, mm-hmm. so we have some data, um, not with the exosomy, but with the Valkay, the bortozumab, uh, that uh, the bortozumab might actually uh, be helpful on uh, uh, controlling uh, some graft versus disease. So in this particular clinical trial, we actually use both drugs. We use the Valkay after the chemotherapy as a graft anti-graft versus of disease drug, and then we use the exosomib um, in the maintenance, uh, you know, is a, a new oral proteasome inhibitor that was approved uh, more recently. So the idea is we don't want to affect the quality of life of patients, so it's by mouth, it's given only once a week, uh, and uh, the idea is let's control the myeloma, and with the drug, also maybe we can have reduced graft versus host disease. Mm-hmm. Now, a couple things on that. I did hear, because I attended the ASH this last year, and I heard also that sometimes the proteasome inhibitors were better for high-risk patients in some of the data that I saw Yeah, as yeah, maintenance yeah, therapy have, uh, versus are... like the imids. Yes. We, we do have a lot of data um, on uh, proteasome inhibitors for patients with high-risk disease. Um I would say that, you know, it's very difficult, though, um, 
um, in the maintenance because, for instance, all the maintenance trial with Ravlamid, um, you know, the CLGB, the U.S. study, we didn't have cytogenetics, so, so it's very difficult to say uh, if there was a difference between standard risk or high risk, and the Ravlamid was very successful, was very good for a lot of patients. Um, and, um, and the Ravlamid in the maintenance setting in the uh, French study was also okay for the high risk. But, but nevertheless, I, I, we think that the proteasome inhibitor, the addition of a proteasome inhibitor may be important for patients with high risk disease. So uh, the problem with the Ravlamid there were some studies of using Ravlamid after allogeneic transplant, but the Ravlamid, you know, the lanalidomide is an uh, immunomodulator, so uh, we had uh, the, the trial that was done at the Moffitt Cancer Center showed uh, uh, an increased rate of uh, uh, acute graft versus host disease when the Ravlamid was added mm. earlier after transplant. And so that's the reason why we decided not to use the Ravlamid, but go with the proteasome inhibitors. Mm -hmm. So but just maybe, to clarify for patients, yeah. Yeah. No, no, well, go ahead. Just, just to clarify for patients, so sometimes you can have acute graft versus host, which is the bad kind of graft versus host. Yeah. And sometimes you can have a little bit of graft versus host disease, and that's actually kind of good from what I understood. So... Um, so the graft versus disease is the new immune system uh, reacting against the host. And, um, and uh, so having the acute, uh, you know, is, is not good, but uh, we right. generally are able to control it very quickly. You can uh, develop chronic GVHD. Sometimes we tell patients it's not good to have graft versus disease because it implies uh, more therapy with the steroids and other immunosuppressants. But sometimes, you know, we know that if we have a little bit of graft versus host disease, we might, in fact, have also some graft versus tumor effect. That means the, the new immune system is so strong that it's uh, probably reacting against the tumor as well. So that's the reason why <laughs> you hear mm -hmm. us telling the patient having a little bit is not bad because it's an, an indicator of that. But what we're trying to do, we're, we're trying to develop some studies where we actually select the cells that we want to use after allogeneic transplant, the lymphocyte that we want to use. So we want to use some lymphocyte that will not cause the graft versus host disease, but only the graft the versus tumor effect, and that is what the future, what we are aiming to do uh, with some of our studies. Uh, so we can select uh, the lymphocytes that we don't want because they're causing a graft versus host disease, but we want some lymphocytes uh, that uh, are very important as an anti-tumor. That would be amazing if you could do that. <laughs> that would... That yeah, well, that's, that's one, of yeah, yeah, that yeah. one of the study. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the study that uh, that we we do well have um, with NK cells after transplant for that reason. So there are a lot of strategies. What I'm trying to say is very difficult to explain. So the strategy, but there are a lot of strategies to improve the transplant, doing maintenance after a normal ablative to reduce the risk of relapse. Uh, doing mm -hmm. boost of lymphocyte for the same purpose, um, to use different type of chemotherapy to decrease the mortality, the complication of chemotherapy. So there are a lot of strategies that we can do and that we have done over the last several years to improve uh, the, the outcome and uh, decrease the risks of allogeneic transplant. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask this, too, because I see a lot of new immunotherapy-type strategies being added to autologous stem cell yes. transplant. Are there other strategies that doctors are thinking about or researchers are thinking about with in the allo setting? Because this, your open study is great. You're using you know, proteasome inhibitor maintenance with this um, reduced-intensity allo transplant. Are there other strategies that are also being considered, like using a drug like daratumumab? Or, I mean, then you're mixing your immunotherapy, so is that a good thing, or are there some risks to that, to doing that? Yeah, well, we, you know, we don't know yet. That's the reason why yeah. we 
um, we need to you run the study <laughs> yes do the clinical study because of mm-hmm. course these drugs uh, are um, phenomenal we need to find the right niche for all these drugs uh, but we also be very cautious we can use them outside of a clinical trial whatever we want because we can actually cause more uh, harm than good and so yes you're absolutely right I think that there are so much that we can do um, to improve both approaches I mean the allo is now a, a treatment approach that can be offered to all patients because uh, it's too risky. Uh, the patients may not be fit enough, but the age is the limit, the limitation. So uh, how we can make the, the autologous transplant better if we believe the immune system is very important using these immunotherapy strategies after the autologous transplant is going to, you know, antibodies, uh, immunotherapy after mm-hmm. transplant, that is it's going to be the future. Uh, the next few years, you'll see trials uh, designed in that way. Mm-hmm. And when you talk about performance status, I just want to stress to people that this is your fitness level, right? So this is both your fitness and maybe other disease complications that you might have, like let's say you have diabetes or a heart condition or something like that. So it's kind of all wrapped up into that. But I think that's why we're stressing fitness so much in patients. In yeah. Patients. No, I, I, yeah. So when, yeah. When you emailed me, I was absolutely interested because we've done studies looking for uh, um, any type of, uh, other comorbidities, any other diseases that, that could interfere with the positive outcome. And actually, uh, we didn't find anything with the exception of the performance status. So if a patient is young but is, has a terrible performance status, uh, is not in good shape, um, it's difficult for us to treat that patient. While a patient 70 playing golf, uh, you know, very active is a different story. You can treat that patient mm-hmm. more aggressively. So uh, the performance status is important. I completely agree with you, and um, you know, I will be one of your advocates for uh, for your program. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Well, thank you, and we're excited to to run that program. Yeah. Um, so, a question about this stu- this study that's open right now. How many centers is it? It's open at Duke, right? And it's open at how yeah. many other centers? And then how? What's the age limit for that? You say young patients, but what does that mean? So uh, I think the age uh, limit is less than sixty-six years old, and uh, I do not remember how many centers in the country, but there are several. So I will need to go to clinicalgovernment.com. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. But it's open in all the big centers in the country. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll include a link to that study in the final transcript that we do for this show so people can find it. And uh, we typically use the Spark Cures tool because it's so much easier to find than on clinicaltrials.gov. So another question is when you think about the um, life is reduced intensity plus maintenance, I know sometimes other strategies like Let's say, how does this, how does an upfront allo transplant for a young patient compare with a tandem transplant or an auto allo, mini allo, or even an allo allo, which I think that would be crazy hard. But yeah. um, how would that, how does that, how do they all compare? And is there data that shows different approaches, especially for high risk patients? So we do have a lot of data, um, but uh, they're all, uh, you know, it's a a little bit controversial. There was a huge study um, that was conducted several years ago in the United States where patients with newly diagnosed myeloma were uh, randomized based if they have a a donor or not to receive a tandem autologous transplant uh, versus an autologous transplant followed by a mini transplant. And uh, and that uh, trial uh, um, so far is now showing difference um, between the two approaches. Um, while there are other trials, uh, and, and you know you can you can talk a lot about. It, so you don't you don't want to do an allogeneic transplant for a patient that doesn't need it. 
because you right. increase the risk so the mortality and you can really control the myeloma with other strategies so you don't want to do that and that's the reason why uh, we started to focus in uh, on the high risk and you know uh, there are some data that may be the high risk but uh, um, there are uh, some positive data from Europe showing the auto allo was better than the tandem transplant so it's very Controversial. There are so many data, but the, the allogeneic transplant, uh, you know, it, it, there are a lot of small studies that you compare and they have different design. So it's very difficult to put all the data together. But the bottom line is that, yes, we see a plateau phase. That means the curve uh, stop to keep going down, uh, meaning that maybe we have uh, reached uh, you know, a, a cure for some patients. And that's the reason mm-hmm. why, again, I'm going back, uh, that we have to revisit uh, this approach. But uh, but it, it's difficult. Uh, I, I think that the, the study, the study that was mentioned, uh, was for all patients uh, without knowing their cytogenetics. And I don't think it's necessary uh, mm-hmm. I don't think that uh, we need to do that. And, um, and you know, the data on the, the tandem transplant are also very controversial, too. We don't even know right. now that we have maintenance if we need to do a tandem transplant. So right. uh, there were a couple of controversial studies at ASH. So one from the U.S. that didn't show any difference, but the European do. Uh, so um, we still have a lot of research a lot of uh, you know uh, questions to answer so uh, i think right. it's too early. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah but yeah, so, so i don't want to i don't want to come out of these and say the allogeneic transplant is going to be the, the the key it's only for selected patients and as part of a clinical trial is still a very difficult approach and even for me, sometimes it's difficult to offer to a patient because I know that there are uh, possible complications involved with. So sometimes I have to think about, and sometimes, you know, I have uh, to change my strategy. So sometimes, you know, I, I change as it goes because I think that the patient is doing well with the chemotherapy. I might do a tandem transplant, a consolidation based on the uh, the response, uh, but I keep the allogeneic only for a, sh- a small group of patients. Mm-hmm. Well, I think this just stresses the fact that myeloma patients really need to have a myeloma specialist in their corner <clears throat> because you're dealing with a very complicated cancer, and it's really, in my opinion, it's beyond the scope of what a general oncologist who treats, you know, 20 different cancers is capable of staying up to speed on. Um, even though they can be a really important part of your care. You can get local care. You can travel to see a specialist and get their advice um, and go through some of these different scenarios with your myeloma specialist who's seen, you know, hundreds of or thousands of patients versus, you know, seeing maybe five a year or something like that. So I really want to stress that to patients that no matter how much you love your local oncologist, it's in your self-interest to go find a myeloma specialist who has this kind of depth, like like you do. Um, and they let me ask they you don't one have more. To transfer, uh-huh. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. They don't have to transfer no, go ahead. their care. We work on uh, as a team. So right. I always tell the patient, right. you know, we work together. So you come, uh, or we can make a recommendation and then work together. So they they don't have to transfer their care to the big institution necessarily. Right. And I do that with my doctor, and I know lots of patients that do that. Yeah. So another question about aloe transplant. How how effective have you seen it be as a salvage strategy for relapsed patients? So I, we actually have some data that is effective also in the setting. I'm always concerned. We have some, some good data, actually. Uh, that is effective in the setting, but you have to be able to control the myeloma first. And I actually do have a clinical trial at Duke also in the relapse setting, um, but we use 
maloability. We use high-dose chemotherapy to prepare a patient because we know that we are dealing with a more aggressive myeloma, so we have to use the chemotherapy um, to control the myeloma while we establish the new graft. So, mm-hmm. yes, I've done it, um, but I generally, in the relapse setting, I, until we improve the normal ablative, you know, until we found the strategy after the best maintenance, uh, the boost with the lymphocyte, I think uh, sometimes I favor the maloablative. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Well, I know you have other clinical trials and before open, and before I send it to caller questions, I'm just wondering if there are other clinical trials at Duke that you would like to share because um, I know one of your patients helped me get connected with you and he said you have some interesting things going on. Well, like all, uh, uh, you know, big institutions, uh, we are a part of uh, um, di- different groups and uh, we collaborate with each other. I think in the past, uh, it was, you know, in the United States, you could see every single institution having their own individual trials, and we were not able to accrue a, a lot of patients, but now we work as a team. So we have a lot of uh, trials uh, in collaboration with other institutions. So, um, oh, of course, so we have uh, new drugs. Uh, we, I, I'm sure Adash, you heard a lot about the venetoclax. Uh, mm-hmm. So we work a lot with these drugs. We have um, another couple of trials opening uh, with the venetoclax in combinations. Um, and then uh, we use uh, with the PD-1 inhibitor, you know, we have uh, um, the combination with different type of PD-1 inhibitors. So we're talking about the immunotherapy again in combination with uh, pomalidomide, and other drugs, and then we have um, uh, another drug that was uh, also presented, the Selinexor. Um, we also have that available in different combinations. Um, what else? Uh, we do. <laughs> we have uh, probably a lot. We have, <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot. Yes, uh, we do. Um, we have some very interesting. Uh, uh, in a newly diagnosed opening uh, with a data tumor uh, that is going to be incorporated up front, that is going to be very interesting to see if the data tumor uh, can improve uh, the response rate up front. So that will be uh, uh, a key. Um, so, you know, we try uh, to have new drugs, um, new combinations. So when we have a patient uh, coming from the community, uh, was already uh, failed multiple lines of therapy we can have. Oh, and we do actually have a very important trial from a, a colleague of mine, a Duke, Dr. Kang, uh, is with the drug uh, first in myeloma. is a oral drug, so we just recently opened this clinical trial, which is going to be very important to see if we have another drug that we can add to the myeloma, you know, um, uh, drugs uh, and uh, and uh, so we're trying to have and we're always in collaboration with different pharmaceutical companies, other institutions uh, to trying to make sure that we have um, clinical trial available for uh, uh, patients at different stages of their disease. Mm-hmm. Right, you need to have yeah, a lot have- of different options open. Right, because when they come and they have progressed through uh, lenalidomide, bortosomib, pomalidomide, carfilzomib, but then you're going to start to run thin. So we like to have a combination so that can be available uh, also in the setting. Or oh, we can improve mm-hmm. other combinations. Right. Well, we yeah, it, I, it's just so clear that the academic centers and places where um, – my loma specialists are practicing like you have a lot going on and there's a lot to offer. And some of this, it seems like, well, for me, it kind of was um, part of just a personality fit too. Like some patients kind of want to hit it really hard out of the chute and other patients might be a little concerned about doing that or may not have to do that. Um, so having a variety of options open for to be able to tailor treatment is really nice. 
I agree, yeah. Well, let me open it up for caller questions. So if you have a question for Dr. Gaspretto, please call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. So we'll start with our first question at 889-4902. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Gasparetto. Uh, first of all, I want to say I love your accent, and <laughs> that's pretty pretty neat accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit too strong at time. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a pretty <laughs> accent. <laughs> so I, I wanted to ask how long does it normally take to find um, a matched donor for minority group patients? Oh, that that is a, an amazing, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, we can't because uh, uh, we don't have enough donors. That's the reason why uh, we have advocate. I actually have a patient of mine that uh, uh, does that, goes around to uh, teach younger, uh, uh, you know, uh, people around, he goes to schools, uh, to colleges, uh, to educate and uh, um, and increase the number of uh, uh, donors uh, for uh, the disparities, for the minority, because you're uh, absolutely right, it's uh, easier to found, unfortunately, a donor for uh, a Caucasian that is for uh, an African-American or Hispanic. It's absolutely, that is a problem. Yeah. So we have and, to raise and, and the the community and explain that we have to raise the community. We have the awareness. We have to uh, uh, make sure that uh, that potential donors understand it. That is very safe. It's very safe procedure for them. And how effective are some of the websites that are out there to um, for donors? Are are they pretty good or how how what would be your opinion about that I'll say it again ask me again i'm sorry what uh, like what is how effective are some of those websites that recruit um donors donors for, for uh, well that's yes. the reason why they, they're good but i think having uh, people the ambassadors okay going around and uh, and talk directly with potential donors uh, is much more helpful because i think there is uh, a preconception people don't understand that the, the the donation is actually relatively easy very safe so and uh, we generally at the beginning they just do a buckle swab uh, to store uh, the initial uh, uh, material so we can have an initial mm-hmm. idea of uh, um, the HLA um, code. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think we need to do more <laughs> because we need more donors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for doing this and answering my question. Sure, of course. Okay, thanks so much. So we had another question that I will ask on behalf of Dana Holmes, who's a smoldering myeloma patient. And um, is there any role for allogeneic transplant in the high-risk smoldering set? Oh, you know what? She's on, so I'm going to let her ask this question herself. Go ahead, Dana. (laughs) Hi, Dana. Do you want to ask a question? So call her 847-85. Five seven four eight. Go ahead with your question. Uh, yeah, I have a question for um, oh, okay. younger patients, age um, fifty-two, um, of um, medium risk, but who um, um, found the the BRAF V six hundred E um, gene alteration through the Foundation One Him report, um, and um, you know have been on chemo for um, for um, the better part of three years. Do do you um, advocate uh, an allo um, at this point or only an allo um, uh, after uh, an auto. Um, also, I don't have any siblings, uh, so it has to be an unrelated donor. Uh, where do you see the balance of risk between um, age, um, the fact I've already been on, on treatment on chemo for about three years, 
And um, yeah, no, I, you know the fact that you are on treatment and doing okay, I imagine. Yeah. For a few years, I think at this point I will not, you know, even think about an allogeneic transplant because you are doing okay. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, I, I think as I say, the selection, even when we we do cytogenetics and gene profiling, the durability of response. I mean, the selection. Um, it is a little bit, you know, go b- behind that. <laughs> but uh, so not all patients uh, need an allo. I'm not advocating allo for everybody. We wanted to talk about allo today because yeah. it's an interesting, uh, uh, a different approach. But n- no, th- there are a lot of strategies, uh, particularly if you are on therapy for the last two two years and doing okay. I don't think you need to worry about that. I'm sorry, which therapy? Um, I'm sorry, you which, are, which, you, which, you, you mentioned that you are on therapy? therapy? Yes, yes, uh, mm. from Dex. And, uh, I'm on a computer, yeah. I'm a, yeah. Um, right. But I'm, I'm on a VGPR. But you just said, v- which therapy uh, has achieved high, good success lately? Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't say that. I say, okay. you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to answer your question because we'll need to know the details yeah. of your myeloma, what's going on, and then, uh, yes, you know, can you be eligible for an allo or maybe you, you can uh, remain on continuation of therapy. That is exactly. very difficult. Uh, generally, when, uh, when I talk about allo, you know, I spend a long time with a patient and we go through all the pros and the cons and the alternative options. Right, so it's, right. it's a very difficult question that you're asking me. Yeah. Sure. No, I understand. But in general, uh, if it were, if, if a donor were found, would it be um, uh, a straight up allo or an allo after an order? Or it depends. Do you know? It, did you have an autologous transplant already? No. No. Not yet. No. Never. No. no. So you still have that option. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, the clinical trials that we have open nationally, uh, we generally go directly to the uh, allogeneic transplant, but a little bit earlier on. So in your situations, mm-hmm. I don't know. I will need, again, to see the type of myeloma that you have and sure, what's sure, going sure. on. It's, you know, if if, yeah. you, if you're coming to the point where an allo might be uh, one of the treatment options, uh, it, it will be based on a lot of things. Sure, I understand. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, yeah. Thanks for your question. So my earlier question was just, is is there any role for allo transplant in the smoldering setting? No. <laughs> no, absolutely yeah, I would... not. No. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, actually, there are some interesting clinical trials for, uh, uh, you know, iris smoldering with the intent of curing them, treating them early. Right. No, I will not. I will never offer an allo in the smoldering setting. No. Mm-hmm. You would have to have progressed disease. Well, Dr. Gasparetto, it's been very enlightening to have you on the show today. We're just so thankful that you've joined us and um, just are so grateful for the work that you're doing to help myeloma patients in all varieties, whether uh, in all these different types of immunotherapies, which is allo, includes allo transplant. It's amazing. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you. you know. It was good. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And to our listeners, thank you for listening to Myeloma Crowd Radio. Join us next time to learn more about what's happening in myeloma research and what it means for you. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere 
and each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.